It's rare for a wrestler to get one great run with the WWE, but two great runs? Well, that's usually saved for the likes of Hulk Hogan and The Rocks of the World. Let it never be forgotten then that at the height of both the Hulkamania and the Attitude Era, Ray Trailer stood tall in one of the most prominent positions on the card, regularly taking part in main event angles and holding his own with the promotion's top stars at the time. It shouldn't come as a surprise that he would be placed in this position though because he was always one of the most talented performers on the roster. So join us today as we take a deep dive into his entire career journey in Hard Times, The Big Boss Man Story. Ray Washington Trailer was born on May 2, 1963 in Marietta, Georgia, but given how famous he would go on to become, surprisingly little is known about his childhood. Maybe this was because the future WWE superstar preferred to keep his private life just that for the most part, separating work from home whenever he could. What we do know, however, is that sometime after graduating high school, he got a job working as a corrections officer in nearby Cobb County, becoming a feared figure to inmates who understood that, at 6 foot 7 and 330 pounds, he was not a figure to be messed with. Yes, as WWE in the 80s would become the land of the giants, it's easy to forget when placed next to some of his contemporaries just how huge Trailer was, and it was partially this size that first caught notice of local wrestling promoters in his area who were able to convince him to start training in 1985, with him making his in-ring debut soon after this as he started doing dates for Knoxville, Tennessee's Continental Championship Wrestling. And quickly finding success there, Ray quit his job as a prison warden, deciding to focus entirely on this new venture instead. Soon he was able to impress his bosses enough to where he could get a shot at the NWA Alabama heavyweight title on February 3, 1986, less than a year after his debut. He would of course lose to the at the time champion Robert Soto that night, but this was enough to get him a foot in the door at Jim Crockett Promotions over in North Carolina, where he would soon move, initially working under his real name and performing as a jobber, helping to get more established stars over. During this time, he would have matches against legends such as Tully Blanchard, Ivan Koloff, and Wahoo McDaniel, as well as tag teams including the Midnight Express and the Road Warriors, but the days of jobberdom were never going to last for someone with the skill of trailer, and it was Jim Crockett's booker at the time, Dusty Rhodes, who was the first person to realize this, with the American Dream pulling the rookie from TV for 12 weeks soon after this so he could repackage him as a more formidable character, that being Big Bubba Rogers, a mean, take-no-prisoners heel. And so, by the May 31st episode of Worldwide, Big Bubba would make his on-screen re-debut, acting initially as the silent bodyguard to Jim Cornette who, along with the Midnight Express, was feuding with the team of Rhodes and Magnum TA at that time. This saw the heels heavy get a big push as he would initially be portrayed as an unstoppable monster villain, someone who could run through almost anyone he came across. It even led to him getting a singles feud with the Dream, the two facing off in a number of bunkhouse stampede matches over the course of 1986. And despite being the more experienced competitor, Dusty was never able to get a clear lead in the series, with them ending up being tied for wins when it was eventually decided that there would be a blow-off cage match to see who the ultimate winner would be later that year. Of course, the babyface ended up getting the win that night, but the sheer fact that Big Bubba had been placed into such a high-profile feud with the promotion's top star and, for the most part, went 50-50 in wins with him was a huge vote of confidence in his abilities. Continuing to build on this momentum then, the big man next moved into a feud with Ron Garvin, this all climaxing in a Louisville street fight at Starcade 1986 where he would pin the babyface in convincing fashion after a brutal brawl. Following that, and a new year would see a new promotion to conquer as Ray jumped over to the Universal Wrestling Federation after it had been purchased by Crockett, the boss feeling that he wanted to add more star power to his newest acquisition. And while with the UWF, Big Bubba would continue to be a dominant force, quickly proving this by winning a handicap match against Mike Reed and the Glassman during his debut on April 18, 1987. He would go on to prove this even further when the very next night, he challenged One Man Gang for the UWF heavyweight title, and would ultimately beat the big man to take home the belt, leaving himself sitting on top of the mountain. 
After that, Big Bubba aligned himself with General Skander Akbar and his Devastation Inc. stable, using this new allegiance to help him hold on to the world title for a full three months as he defended it against the likes of Steve Cox, Barry Windham, and Michael Hayes, all before eventually losing it to notorious tough man Dr. Death Steve Williams on July 11th of that year. Still, by this point, a loss like that wasn't enough to slow the Georgia native down for long, as by the end of that month, he was teaming with the Four Horsemen to take on the Road Warriors, Nikita Koloff, Dusty Rhodes, and Paul Ellering at that year's War Games match. After that, he began going after the UWF Tag Team titles, taking on a number of different partners including the Angel of Death, the Terminator, and Black Bart, but ultimately being unsuccessful in each attempt. And he was also unsuccessful in his attempts to regain the UWF world title at this point, as no matter how many shots he got at Dr. Death, he just couldn't get one over on the champ. This was partially what led him to cut bait with the promotion in 1988 then, with the big man feeling that he needed a fresh start elsewhere to revitalize himself. And where better to make a fresh start than in the land of the rising sun, where on March 26th of that year, Trailer would make his debut for All Japan Pro Wrestling at their annual Champion Carnival Tour. On that night, he would team with Bruiser Brody to take on Jumbo Saruta and John Tenta, the future Earthquake, the heels eventually taking the babyface duo to a double countout draw. After that, he would make a number of further appearances, usually teaming with Brody as he faced off against a cavalcade of Japanese superstars such as Jinichiru Tenru, Giant Baba, and Tiger Mask. All this coming before he would wrestle his final match with the company against Saruta on April 22nd at the close of the tour. Now fully reinvigorated then, Ray set his sights on returning to North America where he had ambitions of getting a job with the biggest promotion in the world, WWE. Of course, at this point, WWE was right in the middle of their first boom period, with stars like Hulk Hogan, Macho Man Randy Savage, and The Ultimate Warrior helping to turn the company into a worldwide entertainment spectacle, the scale of which the industry had never seen before. So with that in mind then, the former UWF champion was only too happy to sign on the dotted line when Vince McMahon, impressed with what he'd seen him do elsewhere, offered him a contract in June of 1988 having him make his in-ring debut soon after this as he began portraying his new gimmick of the Big Boss Man, a corrections officer from Cobb County, Georgia that was clearly heavily inspired by Trailer's past employment history. And it was pretty easy then for the big man to get into this character given it was basically just him with the volume turned up, this being enough for him to sell the whole thing well enough so that he would become an instant sensation in the company as a monster heel who being brought to the ring by Slick, would pummel his opponents into submission, then lay in a further beatdown with his signature nightstick after the match was over, usually after handcuffing his victims to the ropes first. So quickly did these antics get over in fact that, after beating Coco Beware at the inaugural SummerSlam show that August, the big boss man began a feud with Hulk Hogan, kicking this off by attacking him during an episode of the Brother Love Show that autumn. And during this feud, he would also form a union with Akeem, the former one-man gang, the two going on to call themselves the Twin Towers, as together they waged war on both the Hulkster and his Mega Powers tag partner Randy Savage, the, at the time, WWE Champion. This eventually climaxed in a match between all four men at February 3rd, 1989's The Main Event, the very same match that would see the Mega Powers finally explode when Savage turned on Hogan backstage afterwards. And though the bout itself would see the Twin Towers lose, being in the ring with the WWE champ and the face of the company so soon after debuting was a sign of just how much McMahon saw in his newest acquisition. Continuing on in this manner then, the boss man and Akeem kept up their winning ways by defeating the Rockers at WrestleMania V, then spending the spring and early summer of 1989 after that feuding with Demolition over the WWE Tag Team titles. Following this, the Cobb County Corrections Officer even got a chance to settle his beef with Hogan one-on-one -on -one when he challenged him across the house show circuit in a number of steel cage matches, the last of which was aired on the May 27th Saturday night's main event and saw the heel lose after being superplexed from the top of the cage. And so, now with the Hulk program well and truly put to bed, WWE began thinking of ways to do something new with the boss man character. This eventually leading to them turning him babyface in February of 1990 after he refused to accept a payoff from the million dollar man Ted DiBiase in exchange for stealing Jake Roberts' beloved python Damien. 
This saw the crowd quickly turn to his side in droves, something which was helped by the introduction of a colorful new theme song that saw him warn other heels that they'd be serving hard times if they ever messed with him. After that, the face turn was fully solidified when the lawman took on his former partner Akeem at WrestleMania 6, handily defeating him in under two minutes. From there, he went a step beyond by mending fences with Hulk Hogan, and even became something of an ally to him, appearing in his corner during his match against Earthquake at August 27, 1990's SummerSlam. He was also a part of the Hulkster Survivor Series team later that year, where, along with Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Tugboat, the babyfaces were able to defeat the heel unit of Earthquake, Dino Bravo, The Barbarian, and Haku. Yes, things were looking up for the big man, and going into 1991, it took another step forward, as he began a beef with Bobby Heenan and his family, this seeing him face off against and defeat a number of the heel stable, including the Barbarian at the Royal Rumble and Mr. Perfect at WrestleMania 7. Come that year's SummerSlam, though, he would get one of his most well-known stories while in WWE when he began a program with the Mountie, a dastardly Canadian cop who, rather than using a nightstick to beat down his opponents, would attack them with a cattle prod instead. This ended up seeing both men face off in a jailhouse match at the aforementioned pay-per-view, a match where the loser would have to spend the night behind bars, something which, of course, the Mountie was forced to do come the close. And after soundly putting his Canadian counterpart away, Bossman moved on to an even more memorable program when Nails, a former convict complete with an orange jumpsuit, debuted in WWE, immediately setting his sights on the former prison officer after claiming he had been a victim of police brutality by his hand while behind bars. This all ended up leading to a nightstick on a pole match between both men at November 25, 1992's Survivor Series, during which the boss man's signature nightstick would sit atop a pole in the corner of the ring, with the competitor who was able to reach it first allowed to use it legally as a weapon. And of course, it was the babyface who reached the nightstick first that night, from there subsequently going on to win the match and vanquishing his foe for good. After that big victory, however, the Georgia native began to get pushed down the card as McMahon, who was looking by then to refresh his roster, began going on a youth kick that saw many of his more established stars now being put to new use getting these latest talents over instead. This was what saw the boss man become a fall guy for the likes of Razor Ramon, Yokozuna, and Bam Bam Bigelow in the months that followed. It wasn't, however, where he wanted to be pegged long term, so instead of remaining with WWE then once his contract ran out in 1993, he instead chose to leave and go back to All Japan Pro Wrestling where, now no longer owning the Big Boss Man gimmick, he reverted back to using his old Big Bubba moniker, albeit still performing in his WWE ring gear. And during his second run with All Japan, Big Bubba would start working primarily as a tag team wrestler again, usually being paired up with other gaijin such as Stan Hansen, Kendall Windham, and Steve Williams. That's not to say he didn't have some major singles matches as well though, with him at one point putting on a stellar bout with one of the promotion's four pillars, Kenta Kobashi. Come the end of the year, however, he would head back to North America where it was initially expected that he would rejoin WWE. It has since been suggested by Jim Cornette, however, that due to Trailer wanting to protect his gimmick of a law enforcement character from any controversy during the midst of the steroid trial, he instead chose to sign with WCW, making his re-debut there as The Boss on the December 18, 1993 episode of Saturday Night and getting a pinfall win over Rick Rude. After that, he began feuding with Vader throughout 1994, all while changing his ring name to the Guardian Angel after WWE sent a cease and desist to the company, complaining that his previous moniker was too similar to his Fed one. Not that the Guardian Angel name stuck for long either because by 1995, after turning heel again, he would start going by Big Bubba Rogers, using this change to help propel him towards a victory over Sting at that March's uncensored pay-per-view. Following that, things would begin to take down swing again though as he joined the infamous Dungeon of Doom stable, feuding with ex-member John Tenta for a while before improving his stock once more by jumping to the NWO. His stay with this stable would also turn out to be short-lived however as he would be ousted from the dominating heel group come February of 1997, returning not long after that to begin a feud with them and going through members such as Scott Hall, Kurt Henning, and Vincent en route to his ultimate goal of taking down the boss himself, Eric Bischoff. 
Sadly though, the Georgia boy would never get to achieve this last part because by April of 1998, his contract with the company would expire and they would decide not to re-sign him, this leaving him with no choice but to go back to WWE looking for work. It was lucky for Trailer then that WWE ended up being the best place for him because they were skyrocketing in popularity at that time. The Attitude Era just beginning to kick into full swing as the Machiavellian boss Vince McMahon spent week after week doing everything he could to wrangle the world title away from Steve Austin. And it was after several months of having no luck doing this that he eventually decided to try turning to the past again when, on October 12th of that year, he reintroduced audiences to the Big Boss Man. Now however, the Big Boss Man was no longer the benevolent fan favorite he had once been. No, instead, he was portrayed as more of a SWAT-style cop, acting as the personal attack dog of McMahon's corporation stable, primarily this new version of the character, which in hindsight feels like the blueprint for the shield in the years to come, would be used to go after Austin at any given opportunity, but outside of this, he also found time to win the WWE Tag Team titles with Ken Shamrock on one occasion, the WWE Hardcore title on four occasions, and even getting a chance to challenge The Undertaker's undefeated streak on the grandest stage of them all at WrestleMania 15. Of course, this match, which was held inside the confines of Hell in a Cell, was a bit of a stinker and had an unfortunate ending which saw the heel enforcer get hung from the rafters, but it was still a big moment regardless. The real Botchamania segment, however, came when the big boss man started a feud with Al Snow that summer, a feud which has since become infamous for seeing him kidnap Snow's pet chihuahua, Pepper, then cook him and feed him to his unknowing owner. Yeah, the Attitude Era could be a really weird place at times. After that, the two had arguably the worst match in WWE history, a Kennel from Hell match that took place at September 26, 1999's Unforgiven pay-per-view and saw the ring be surrounded by not only a steel cage, but the Hell in a Cell too. All well, in between these, vicious attack dogs were supposed to roam. The winner would be the first man to escape both cages without being mauled, but unfortunately the whole thing ended up turning into a farce when the dogs became far less interested in attacking and much more interested in urinating around the ringside area and mating with each other instead. After that, all the boss man could really do was lean into the slapstick as he began morphing into one of the most pantomime villains in the company's history, starting a feud with the Big Show over the WWE Championship in the winter of that year. During its early weeks, this feud would see the kayfabe death of Big Show's father, but rather than show any sympathy for the giant, the villainous cop would instead do things like come to the ring to read poems blasting the deceased and, most outrageously, invade the funeral itself dragging the coffin away with a chain attached to his car while a distraught show clung to it for dear life. It sounds completely tasteless of course, but it was so silly to watch at the time that it was impossible to get offended, with it falling completely into Monty Python level silliness as the weeks went on. As with all things in wrestling though, it ended in a match, this one taking place at that December's Armageddon which the big boss man would eventually lose. And after that, the Georgia native moved back down to the mid-card as he started a brief tag team run with Prince Albert, the two mainly feuding with Test, the Fabulous Moolah, and Mae Young up until January of 2000, at which point they finally imploded after losing a match to the Hardy Boys. And after the fallout to this, the former corrections officer once again returned to the hardcore division until later that year when he would pick up another new protege in the form of Bull Buchanan. This union, as it turned out, would turn out to be more successful, as together they would beat both The Godfather and D'Lo Brown at WrestleMania 2000 and the APA at the following month's backlash. By the summer of that year, however, this team would be finished too and the veteran would be relegated to glorified enhancement talent once more as he started primarily making appearances on B-shows such as Sunday Night Heat and Jacked. By December of 2001, he had managed to make it back up to SmackDown, but even then, he was still being used to get others over as he suffered losses to the likes of Steve Austin and The Rock in the lead-up to the world title matches against Chris Jericho in the months following. And from there, it was back down to the secondary shows again, somewhere where Bossman would ultimately spend the remainder of his time with the company, running out his contract until he would leave altogether in 2003. Still, he wasn't content to hang up his boots quite yet, and so, now out of WWE once more, Ray Trailer ventured back out east, working a few dates for the International Wrestling Association of Japan. Sadly though, 
This would be the last place he would end up working, as on September 22, 2004, he would be found dead after having suffered a massive heart attack. At just 41 years old, he was far too young to go, becoming yet another example of wrestlers of that era who left us all too soon. The life and career of the Big Boss Man would be celebrated in the years to come, with his being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2016 when his wife and daughters were able to posthumously put him where he deserved to be. And with this done, his legacy will now be secure because WWE will never let his contributions to the industry be forgotten. Yes, it's rare that someone can have not just one but two notable runs with the biggest promotion in the world, and that's not even starting on the success that he had elsewhere. So when we think of the best big men in wrestling history, we know that Ray Trailer will forever go down as one of the all-time greats. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.